Well, good morning. 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 Welcome to Heritage on this beautiful, beautiful sunshine today. Isn't it wonderful to see the sun again? Yeah. Yes. Great. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, if you haven't filled out one of the uh, Who You Are cards in quite a while, we'd appreciate you just filling one out. They should be in the back of the pew and uh, drop it in the uh, offertory as it's passed so we can keep up to date with everything. And the other thing, for those of you who did not know, we do have a small business card out there that you can carry with you that has uh, Randy and David's phone numbers as well as the address of the church on it if you need that. The other thing is, uh, today is the first Sunday of the month, believe it or not. Uh, glad January is over, I don't know how about you. Uh, Randy will be uh, giving military prayer today, and also there will be no junior church today. They'll stand here with us. Um, we have uh, the combined choir that's being put together. So for the Easter Cantata, make sure you follow up with David on that if you're interested. The Valentine dinner, there is a mistake in your bulletin in regards to it says uh, Friday, February the 15th, but it's actually on Saturday. And if you haven't signed up, there's a sign up sheet in the back on the small table. The mission committee uh, will be meeting Wednesday, uh, the 19th at 7 o'clock p.m. Any questions on that whatsoever, if you can't make it or if you want to make it, please see Wilbur Klein. And then just a brief announcement on the, on the Bible studies that we have. Uh, Wednesday at 11 o'clock, Randy is teaching a uh, class here on the Psalms. Then Thursday morning at 6 a.m., David Ladd is teaching a prayer or teaching a class on different types of prayer and different topics. Thursday afternoon, uh, Steve Willard leads a family study. And then, of course, we have our different Bible studies here during the week, uh, except for today. And then uh, every Sunday morning at 9.30, 9.45, uh, Bill Nance teaches his Sunday school. So that's what we have for us going today. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, write it down for us, and we'll be happy to uh, look at it and pass it on to you accordingly. Okay. Hey. Thank you, John. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to see everybody here this morning. Welcome to Heritage Christian Church, and we're happy to have you here. And let's open by standing as we sing Jesus Saves. <laughs>
Father, we want to praise you and thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you, O oh God, for another opportunity to come into your house and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we look forward to the sermon this morning. We pray your blessing upon Pastor Randy. Help him, O oh God, to deliver what you want us to hear this morning. May our hearts be open and receptive to receive that. Again, Father, we're so thankful that Jesus saves. And we do triumph over the tomb through Jesus. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, turn around and shake hands with those around you. Tell them how glad you are. They're here this morning. First Sunday of the month, we pray for the military. I remember hearing a Korean War veteran years ago say that his parents told him when he left for Korea, they said, we will pray every day, seven days a week at a certain time on the clock. They adjusted, obviously, for time difference in Korea. And he said, you don't know what that meant to me, knowing that at a certain hour, my parents were in prayer for me. Who do you pray for? We, we all hopefully pray for somebody. And we've got people in our church family with loved ones that they're hoping will be home soon. And I mean, you know, maybe this week or next. We're grateful for that. But we want to pray for our troops right now as we go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, it's the first Sunday of the month. It's a habit we've been doing for some 12, 13, 14 years. Praying for the military. On the first Sunday of the month, we continue it. We're not embarrassed about it. We're, we will continue to do it as long as we feel led to do that. We do it today. Everybody's got some a picture in their head, in their mind, of who they need to pray for. A person, a son or daughter, a, a niece, a nephew, a grandson, a granddaughter. Just We lift those people up today and pray for them in general for their protection. Bless this service on the first Sunday of the month. Thank you for the sunshine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our next hymn, let's sing Footsteps of Jesus.
399 and sing more love to thee. Gracious and heavenly Father, we indeed thank you for this morning that we can join here in this building, your church. We thank you that we can sing songs of praise, lift up our voice in these hymns. Above all, Father, we thank you for the precious gift of your Son, Jesus. On the communion table here, we have the bread and the cup. And I pray that as these emblems are passed, that those that take my eat and take and eat and drink in this manner, in a worthy manner, that in our mind's eye we might look back to that event on the cross where Jesus died for us, that he had our sins removed, and he gives us the hope and the promise of eternal life. 
I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Today is Super Bowl Sunday, and they say that the average person will spend more than $81 on Super Bowl Sunday today. That's a lot of Doritos. <laughs> Some of the tickets are going for as much as $5,000. On the other hand, a Barna study recently said that more than 80% of Christians, practicing Christians, feel that generosity is extremely or very important. God loves a cheerful giver. And he loves a generous one. Let's do that now. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give to something and to you, Lord, to a cause that will uh, bear fruitful dividends, eternal dividends. So we thank you for this time for us to be cheerful, generous givers. Bless each gift today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
songs that Jeannie played there, uh, each one of them was uh, I've sung his specials before, uh, probably one of the first ones was he could have called 10,000 angels. Uh, back when I started singing, there, there were no such things as, as accompaniment tapes and this type of thing. You usually had somebody to, to uh, play the song on the, the piano and, uh, and sing, and that was, that was one, of my, one of my favorites. Thank you. The song I'd like to bring this morning is entitled where no one stands alone.
I have a notion that somebody came here today just to hear that song. You, that spoke to you in a need in your life, and I'm glad you're here today. The uh, message is today is part two of a message we began last week on the subject of anger, and I, it's such a heavy-duty topic in your life because anger is a heavy-duty topic in your life that I like did this last week and I'm doing it today. I like to start with some lighter stuff. There's nothing funnier than an angry baby. <laughs> Do you agree? I mean, you can see those pictures there. Now, everybody in this room can think of somebody in your life that looks like one of these six kids. <laughs> And some of you can say, that looks like my husband, that looks like my wife, that, uh, that expression. I've seen that before. I've done so much research on the subject of anger over the last few weeks, and I really mean this, I'm not making this up, that I've discovered all kinds of articles and pieces of writing on repressed anger, the expressed anger, violent anger, marital anger, par uh, parental anger, and the list goes on and on. But the most interesting one that I found was disguised anger, hidden anger in people's lives. So I'm going to start with something light with uh, two or three examples of that. This one says a classified ad in a newspa newspaper read this way, wedding dress for sale, never worn. We'll trade for a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber pistol. <laughs> Hidden name, disguised name. We'll trade for a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber pistol. The second one here, I, I love this. This is somewhat crude, I apologize for it, but it's still valid. A woman was married to a husband who had a habit of making her angry. One day, one of her friends said, how do you stay married to a guy who's so frustrating in his behavior? The meek wife replied, oh, when he makes me mad, I just go and clean the toilet. <laughs> clean the toilet? How does that help? I use his toothbrush. <laughs> That's awful. I'll probably edit that out of the radio. We won't, we won't use that. Two sisters, young sisters, spent the day fighting. That evening, they prepared for bed, still mad at each other. As usual, they knelt by the side of their beds for their evening prayers. Dear God, the eight-year-old began, bless mommy and daddy, bless our cat and our dog. And then she stopped, and her mother gently prodded. Didn't you forget somebody? She glared across the bed at her six-year-old sister and said, oh yes, God. Bless my ex-sister, bless my ex-sister. Disguised anger, repressed anger, and hidden anger. I want to talk about anger today in a way that may speak to you in a profound way, and I really mean that, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Sean Kelly is a minister in the Seventh-day Adventist churches somewhere in the United States. That's all I know, the connection with him, Seventh-day Adventist churches. He said, one of my favorite pastimes is to read entries from a book called the Dor Darwin Awards. The Darwin Awards is a collection of stories describing the stupid things people do. He said, I have found over and over again that I'm reading it, I slap my head and think, how can these people be so stupid? He said, that's especially true for the entry I'm sharing with you this morning. 17-year-old Bob and 20-year-old Bill had just finished watching a Star Wars movie. They were fascinated by the lightsaber duel between people in the movie. So Bob said to Bill, let's have a lightsaber fight that we can record for YouTube. Bill said, that's awesome, man. But Bob, what are we, where are we gonna get lightsabers? They tried to be creative and I'm gonna shorten this story, they went up into the attic of their house, or one of the houses, found some old fluorescent tubes, you know, like six footers, five footers, whatever they are, and they took off, I didn't know you could do this, they took off the ends, 
and believe it or not, they filled them with gasoline. And they went outside and they lit the gasoline and it was foaming and fuming inside those tubes while they were faking this lightsaber fight until the two lightsabers connected and flames went over all of both of them. And it wasn't a fun experience. And Sean Kelly said, what stupid things have you done in your life? Not just because you're 17 or 20, but what stupid things, he said, have you done in anger? Anger releases hormones. I, mean, I probably will read a statement about it, what it does to you physiologically, that people do do stupid things in anger. And the reason you know it's true is because you've done it. So have I. We've all done stupid things and said stupid things in anger. And here's the main message of the, the lesson, or the main point of the message today. And I really am serious. I'm giving you the bottom line right at the beginning. There is a spiritual dimension to anger that most people don't admit, including Christians. There's a spiritual dimension to anger. You know why there's a spiritual dimension to anger? Because there's a spiritual dimension to everything. If you're married, spiritual dimension to your marriage. If you're single, spiritual dimension to being single. If you're a parent, there's a spiritual dimension to being a parent. If you're a son or daughter, there's a spiritual dimension to being a son or daughter. And it goes on from there. There's a spiritual dimension to everything, including the anger in your life. And so one of the most holy moments in a man's life, a woman's life, or a young person's life is this. When I realize the spirituality that's involved in my routinely, routinely getting angry. We're going to read the second half of the passage we started last week. This week it focuses on the tongue, on what we speak. Why would anger be connected with the tongue? Because it's a primary venue for anger is what you say. People say angry things and they hurt with words that destroy, destroy. And one, Tim Keller, who's a minister in New York City that some of you have heard of, he said the most unusual thing to me, not unusual, but different. I've never heard anybody say this. He says, anger will disintegrate your marriage. Anger will disintegrate your relationship with your kids. He said, anger will disintegrate friendships. Anger will disintegrate peace and concord in the home. I mean, it's just something, he said, it doesn't hurt it, it disintegrates it. That's a strong term. To disintegrate anything means to take it apart in small pieces. And he said, anger does that. I think it's a valid point. James 1 is where we read last week. We read the verses 19 to 21, just a few verses, but we pick it up in verse 22 today. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man or a woman who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. And here's the key verse, 26. If anyone considers himself religious, see, one of the few times the word religion is even used in the Bible, it's just not used, and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Isn't it interesting about pollution as a sidebar note? We're concerned about the environment and we're concerned about air pollution and we're concerned about the factory emissions and so forth and it goes on and on but we're not worried about the moral pollution in our culture, in our society, and in our own lives, just as a sidebar note to that last verse. Your tongue represents you. 
I've met people over the years, and so have you, who brag about, I speak my mind. I'll tell you, I'm a guy, I'm a woman who speaks his or her mind, and they brag about that. When's the last time you ever met a person, man, woman, young person, who said, I brag on my tongue. I control my tongue. It's under the control of the Spirit of God. Never. I've never heard anybody say that. Never. And yet, it could be one of the most important things that we could would talk about today. I want to talk about the tongue for a minute. Verse 26, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight ring on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. What's remarkable to me about verse 26, he doesn't say your religion is impacted negatively. He doesn't say your religion is diminished a little. He said it's worthless. Did that speak or resonate with anybody? It does me. Your religion is worthless. And so what we say, what we do with our tongue matters to the Lord. There was a rock group years ago. I remember hearing Paul Harvey talk about it. And some of you have heard this story before. Where the rock group was known for their vile lyrics and their music. And they got a lot of heat from it. People complained, parents complained, and even newspaper people commented on their negative verbiage in their, in their song lyrics. And one of the lead singers for the group said, hey, they're just words. Get over it, they're just words. I want you to listen to a passage of scripture from Matthew 12 where Jesus talks about words. Can we bring that up? Matthew 12, Jesus is speaking. He says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Make a note of that. You, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. When I heard that rock star say, hey, they're just words, I remember thinking, somebody needs to bring Jesus up to speed. He's behind a curve. He doesn't get it. They're just words. Jesus said, you'll give an account for your words. By every word, you will be judged or acquitted. The words may not matter to you or to me, but they matter to the Lord. They matter to the Lord. I want to talk about some examples of anger. This is a powerful story told by a minister confessing his anger. It's the only person I've ever known, not just a minister, whose last name is Human. I've never, anybody know a person named Human? Last name? Phil Human is his name. He's from Lincoln, Nebraska. He tells a story. It's very confessional. It's very honest in what he shares. I have three teenage children and they're great kids but we're all human beings, which is good since he's, never mind, since his name is human. <laughs> From time to time, we get angry with each other. One day I got in an argument with one of my sons and I felt I was right and he felt he was right and then I felt he was disrespectful and he felt I was being a jerk and things got heated and I'm chewing him out and he's had enough of it, storms off to his room and I'm not going to let this happen, so I'm going down the hall right behind him. Don't you walk away from me. And then the door slams shut. The door clicks in the lock, and boom goes my hand through the door. There's a hole in the door. And to this day, I don't remember what we were angry about, and it's embarrassing to see the hole in the door and to show you the truth is, even though it's not that big of a deal, in a sense, it is a big deal. Because that whole represents what he said and what he did. What's out there that represents your hostility? 
What scars, not to a door, but to a soul, have you, have you made an, a, a wife or a husband, a son or daughter, a parent, whatever the case may be? And he said, to this day, I don't even know what we were angry about, but I know that, you know, I had to let somebody, my son, have it and punch a hole through, through the door. He said this, that's the thing about anger. It demands to be indulged. It refuses to be hidden. It seeks to be noticed, and indulging it rarely subsides it. Anger creates more anger. Anger creates more anger. How many times when someone is angry with you, you become angry in return? Don't you disrespect me? Don't you treat me like a baby? Don't talk to me that way. Don't you talk to me in any way like that. Don't you walk away from me. Don't yell at me. Don't you close that door. Don't you tell me what to do. Boom, the fist through the door. Or worse. Or worse. It's a powerful story told by Phil Hewitt from Lincoln, Nebraska. I want to talk about the physical response of anger. This is from Ray Fowler, an author said, the first thing we need to understand about anger is that there is act, it's an actual physical response. He said, um, when you get angry, your body does some pretty amazing things. Neil Anderson describes it well in his book, Getting Anger Under Control, the nerve center in your hypothalamus activates your emergency system, which constricts blood flow to your kidneys, intestines, and skin. At the same time, your brain, brain sends a signal to your adrenal glands to pump large doses of adrenaline and cortisol into your bloodstream. Your muscles tighten, your heart beats faster, and your blood pressure rises. The blood is directed away from your skin and toward your muscles in order to facilitate a fight or flight response. Now listen to this next paragraph. It's really powerful the way it ends. Why does your body do this? To prepare you for action. Physically, it is the exact same response when you're confronted by danger or combat. Neil Clark Warren calls it psych physiological preparedness, an actual physical state that God uses to prepare you to defend yourself in times of danger. Here's the sentence I want you to hear. It's a great response when you're confronted by a bear and her cubs. But it's not so great when you find yourself using that response on your family. Listen to that again. It's a great response when you're confronted by a bear with her cubs. It's not so great when you find yourself using that response with your family. It's a powerful, powerful statement by Ray Fowler. I want to think, talk to you about anger in terms of your words because words represent you. You know what's funny is we remember what people have said to us with total clarity. Some of you can quote what a dad or mom said to you 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And you not only quote it, you quote the inflection. You quote the emphasis that your dad or mom used and we can have total recall when it comes to remembering what people have said to us. But get this, we have total amnesia when we try to remember what we said. Well, I don't remember saying that. Well, I don't remember telling him that or telling her that, and we did. We did. I want to share this with you, that words matter to the Lord, as I read from Matthew 12, and if they matter to the Lord, get this, they should matter to you and to me. If words matter to the Lord, and he says you will be judged by your words, then why shouldn't they matter to you and to me? Let me read 26 again. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his or her tongue, they deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Their religion is worthless. This is a somewhat funny story, but it's not funny. You know, sometimes the funny stories we hear on the news do have a humorous impact on us, but they're not funny to the people that it happens to at the time. I guess it's been almost 25 years since the Arizona Republic newspaper report
reported the story of Steve Tran in Westminster, California. Steve had a bug problem, cockroach infestation in his apartment. He tried everything but couldn't seem to get rid of the nasty creatures. One day he heard about a product known as the Bug Bomb, an aerosol that you simply press a button and then you leave your house for a couple hours, return to a bug-free home. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, what Steve failed to do, he thought if one bug bomb was great, how about five or six? And so he literally like had a half a dozen of these in his apartment, hit the button and got out of the apartment and came back and his apartment was on fire. The drapes went up in flames and it did $10,000 worth of damage to his apartment. He said, I really wanted to kill all the bugs and I thought if I used a lot more, it would last longer. But he did more than fumigate his apartment. He caused ten thousand dollars, over ten grand in damage to his apartment. And what happened to the cockroaches? Listen to this. Steve said, "By Sunday, I saw them crawling among amongst the rubble. They were crawling around the burnt places of his apartment." And he makes the analogy: What damage have you done? with your anger, where you were trying to make a point. That's all you were trying to do. You're trying to straighten somebody out, and it did so much emotional damage. Verse, or Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. What a statement. I want to close by talking about righteous anger. People asked me last week, isn't there a such thing as righteous anger? There is. I think righteous anger can be defined this way. It's when you're angry on behalf of the Father, your Heavenly Father. But so few people are ever angry on His behalf. We're angry on our behalf. You better not mess with me, pal. You better not mess with my feelings. And men and women and young people do that every day. But when are you become angry on behalf of the Father when God's name is taken in vain? When God's name is smirched and people mock the scripture and mock the Bible, and, oh well, that's public opinion. You know, that's the world we live in. And righteous anger or righteous indignation is getting interest in what the Lord's angry about. That's why James says, if anyone considers himself religious and yet doesn't keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. The fact is that how well we control our tongues is a good barometer of spiritual maturity. Many times the true test of the strength of our relationship with Jesus is not our ability to speak our mind as much as it's our ability to bridle our tongue. James has more to say about this, and we've heard this about being slow to speak and swift to hear. We read that last week. It's better to remain silent and be thought of as a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. I want to close with this story. Really dramatic. Mike Minix is a minister either from North or South Carolina. I can't remember which. It's one of the Carolinas. He said, I was preaching years ago in a church, and he uses a term we don't use anymore. How many of you remember going to revivals when you were a kid? The, the, the day of the revival has kind of come and gone in our culture. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just what, what is. And he said, I was preaching revival, and it was a church where they had a lot of conflict. He said, the preacher told me, he said, all these people do is fight. It's the story of our church. And so the preacher didn't ask him to do this. He said, I just felt prompted on my own to do this. He said, I wasn't sure anyone would respond. But during the invitation at one of the services, I sensed God's spirit leading me to ask people to do this. I would ask people if you've got someone in this church that you've experienced anger with or strong disagreements, I want you to go up to the people and confess it to them. And he said, I was sure nobody would respond. But he said, during the invitation, first one person went to another, and then a second person went, and then a third, and then a fourth. And he said, before it was over, he said, people were weeping all over the church. What a moment. He said they were weeping all over the church and embracing as people were confessing their anger and confessing their hostility to other people. 
And Mike Bendick says this, you can hide your anger from others. You can hide your anger from your family. You can hide your anger from people at work, but you can't hide it from the Lord. You can't hide it from the Lord. God works in delivering people from anger. And we talk about anger management. It's the title of this message. I want you to replace our anger management with another word. Anger deliverance. I talked about my family doctor in Columbus, Ohio. Andy and I had a family doctor named Dr. Steve Miller. And Steve was one of the godliest people I've ever known, still is, very dedicated Christian. And we were talking about his patients, just in general, not, not anybody in particular. And he, I will always remember as long as I live what he said. He said, Randy, so many of my patients don't need medication. They need deliverance. Would you listen to that again? So many of my patients don't need medication. I don't need to put them on medication. They need to be delivered. Delivered from what? Hostility, anger, depression, resentment. And as the list goes on, and I think he's right. And so we're not going to end the message talking about anger management. We're going to talk about anger deliverance from the hand of the Lord. Deliverance comes when you confess. Deliverance comes when you admit, you acknowledge and say, Lord, I lay it at the feet of the cross. Remember, I told you that dramatic story about Alan, the, the criminal in a high or maximum security prison in London. He said, probably one of the most angry people I've ever read about. He was just violently angry and in prison as a result. And he said he had to take his anger and literally put it at the foot of the cross in his mind's eye. And he said he did feel deliverance at the hand of God. Why? Because that's what God does. God is the deliverer. You're not, and neither am I. God is the deliverer. He delivers people out of bondage, of all kinds of bondage, including the bondage of anger. Don't ever forget that. His name is Jesus. Let's pray with him right now. Lord, thank you for part two today about anger. We laughed at the beginning, laughing at angry babies. It is funny to see an angry baby, but it's not funny to see an angry 30 or 40 or 50 year old, 20 year old, somebody violently angry and screaming because our words, if we can't bridle our tongue and our religion, you, your word says is worthless. It means it's worth nothing. So what a lesson for all of us today, for every man, every woman in this room, Bless this message as people take it to heart. I'm not asking people today to go up to somebody and apologize for anger, but maybe somebody needs to do that at home today. I don't know. Maybe somebody needs to do that at work tomorrow on Monday. I don't know. Maybe somebody needs to get on the phone today or tomorrow. I don't know. But you know. You know, and in the knowing, we're, we're found out. So, Lord, bless people as they respond to this message in whatever way they do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand together. We're going to have an invitation time. Keith's going to lead us in an invitation. And we close our service by offering people an opportunity to come to give their lives to the Lord, to confess their faith, to obey Him in baptism. If they've never done it, to, to rededicate their life to Ask for prayer. Whatever the needs are, you come as we stand and as we sing. <laughs>
If you just be seated, we close with a time of direct and prayer. Guys, can you bring that picture up of those babies again? I, I think people need to smile a little here at this point. Can you? Yeah, there you go. How many of you see somebody you know? No? Okay, a few hands, some, real quick. Somebody went like this and put it right back down. But, there, but there's a, some revealing expressions. I love that picture of uh, the babies. John's going to go down picking up prayer requests. We pray for people, intercessory prayer. It's the only church I've ever served in my whole ministry where we close with prayer, praying for people like this. I think it's special. We're not going to draw this out, drag it out. We're just going to pray in, in a moment. Oh, I've got a special prayer request that's already been given to me. Some of you know a John, or remember a John Blair, John and Louise Blair. He died this week. Some of you, he goes way back with people. Um, visitation Wednesday, February 5th, Newcomer Funeral Home, Centerville. At uh, 5, 5 to 7, Funeral Thursday, 10 a.m. at Newcomer. John Blair, his wife's name, Louise. Be aware of that. Janice Smith said, daughter Rochelle, severe diabetes and retinopathy, losing eyesight, her family finances. Um, due to both, she and Brian are now out of work due to medical disability. We do want to keep them in prayer for Rochelle and the family. Don Moore, brother-in-law, James Mowry, has an infection in his heart. I've never heard that. And is scheduled to have his leg amputated on Wednesday. James <coughs> Moore, Mowry, or Mowry. Anyone else? Can you think, Keith, do you know of any prayer requests? All right, let's, let's go to the Lord and pray. Lord, I lift up these prayer requests. I lift up the prayer requests on the, in the bulletin. I pray again for our military. I know that uh, Charlie and Fina in our church who are here today praying for their son. We lift him up in a special way. Hopefully, he'll be coming home soon. We, we pray for them. I pray for others, the unspoken prayer requests that I'm not even aware of. We pray for the Blair family and the loss of uh, John. We pray for his wife, Louise, people who know that. Uh, be with David and, and his wife as they're away in Texas with the Sprats and with the Karskis, two of our families that are shared in, in go to Texas when the weather's cold. Those, and just bless their trip. Watch over them. Thank you for today. Thank you for the sunshine. And thank you for the sunshine that you bring into our hearts and our souls, even today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Keith's going to lead us in a closing song and wrap it up. Okay. Let us stand, please.